Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to my beginner's guide for Wo Long. In today's video, I'm going to be going over some of the basic concepts of Wo Long's combat, which will hopefully be useful for you in your very own Wo Long journey. Without any further ado, I would like you to direct your attention to my character's feet. Not like that. I know what you're thinking. Stop. Okay, my character is wearing boots, so you don't have to worry about that. But seriously, look at my character's feet. You'll notice that there's a couple of gauges there. The very first thing you'll notice is that there's the number 10. That represents your morale level, and I'm going to be going over how that particular mechanic works a little bit further in the video. But for now, notice the one below that. That green gauge, that is your health. You know, that's pretty self-explanatory. If that one reaches zero, you're dead. You know, there's no if, ands, or buts about it. So pay attention to that particular health gauge. But one of the most important things, potentially the most important thing in Wo Long, is the gauge that is below your health gauge. That is the spirit gauge. Right now, it is actually empty. I'm going to fill it up with orange just so that you guys can see a little bit better. As you can see, it is filling up. Now, once that fills up with orange, it's actually not a good thing. If that gauge is fully filled up with orange and you get hit, you are basically going to be staggered. Your character is going to be dazed for a little bit and open for attack. Now, what is causing me to reach that gauge all the way into orange is because I'm using the deflect. Deflect in this game is basically dodging. Again, that's going to be something that I will be detailing later. But just be aware of the fact that whenever you dodge, you are going to be using that particular gauge and that is something that you want to keep tabs on think of it almost like stamina except it's going to go both ways because it doesn't just go into the orange orange is when you are using your spirit you can also gain spirit by attacking enemies and how do you expand spirit well you have two attacks in this game one of them is a regular attack which is going to be square or x that's your basic attacks right there, and as you can see, they consume no spirit whatsoever. But you have another attack, which is the triangle or Y, and that is your spirit attack. And as you can see, it's a bit more of a pow more powerful attack. You can think of it almost as like a heavy attack, but it consumes spirit. So it's going to be something that you're going to have to choose how to use. And as you see, if you keep spamming it, it's going to consume more and more spirit. It's important to mention, because now you're looking at it, you're like, oh, it seems like I can just spam that heavy attack. Keep in mind that while you are in combat, if you are getting hit, your spirit is going to be taking a hit as well. So every time an enemy connects with you, you're going to be taking damage, and your spirit gauge is going to be increasing towards the orange side, which is the bad side. It's not necessarily something that you want. But anyways, let's exemplify how this works. We have our volunteer right here. He's our good friend. He's going to work like our targeting dummy because there really isn't a targeting dummy in this game so let's let him hit us a couple of times as you can see notice how our spirit is increasing that's not good we're gonna let him hit us again oh damn that is really bad and he broke us gonna dodge that stop that don't be silly oops i broke his weapon so that's going to invalidate our demonstration. Let's go ahead and reset him. It's okay. He doesn't mind receiving this beating, okay? He's been trained for this. He, he trained for this his whole life. But as I was saying, if you allow yourself to get hit multiple times, essentially what is going to happen is eventually you are going to get broken. And once you are broken, the enemy gets to just go ahead and attack you. You guys could see that my character was basically just like sitting there for a little bit. And uh, you couldn't really do anything against the enemy, right? So that is something that you'll want to pay attention. They also have these special attacks that they can hit you with. Also deal a ton of spirit damage. But yeah, pay attention to your spirit. You do not want to be going into that. Now, if you attack with light attacks, you're going to instead gain spirit. Notice how our spirit is now going into the blue. And now you can use your special attack your uh, spirit attack, so to speak, and it is going to consume all of that extra blue spirit that you have in order to deal more damage, in order to deal more spirit damage, and all of that good stuff. So now you get the idea. It's kind of like a momentum type situation. The more you are able to connect with light attacks, the more your spirit is going to be in the blue, and that's going to be good for you. The more attacks that you receive, the more your spirit is going to go into the orange, and that is not going to be good for you. As you can see right there, you can receive some attacks. Now, if we attack back, we're going to recover. We're going to go into the blue, and then we can use our own spirit attacks to further punish the enemy. 
As I was editing this video, I noticed that I forgot to mention that you can use your spirit attack as a combo finisher whenever you are attacking an enemy. So for instance, this weapon has like four attacks, one, two, three, four, right? It has four inputs, one, two, three, four. And at the end of that, you can chain in your uh, spirit attack as a finisher, which is going to be good because usually if you manage to land these four attacks, you're going to get a blue spirit, which is then going to be transferred into your final attack, like so. I'm going to attack this guy. One, two, three, four, and special. Boom. Right there. So we did additional damage due to the fact that we had blue spirit into our gauge, and that was transferred over into the, uh, the power of the spirit attack. Now, if you pay attention to the enemy, you'll notice that he also happens to have a spirit gauge. And his spirit gauge works very much like our own, which means if we are to attack him, he is going to take additional spirit damage. And if he happens to attack us, he's going to correct that spirit damage. So I'm just going to go ahead, deal a couple of attacks here. See if we can push him into the orange. There's one more. And you'll notice that now he's broken and you can follow up with a special attack. So whenever you are able to fill up the enemy's gauge by basically hitting him multiple times with spirit attacks or regular attacks, you're gonna be able to capitalize with a fatal blow by pressing on triangle or Y. So that's gonna be like one of your objectives, bust up their spirit gauge whilst preventing them from busting up your spirit gauge, okay? But that's not all, because if that was all there was to the combat, it wouldn't be much of a combat system now, would it? Now, you also have other things that consume your spirit. So I told you about the spirit attack, which is kind of like your heavy attack, right? That uses up spirit. You can also cast spells. Now, the way that you cast spells is you hold on the right trigger and press one of the faceplate buttons. This is going to be something that you'll be able to customize depending on which spells you invest in for your character. We're going to be talking more about that in the video. But right now, suffice it to say that as I press the right trigger, my spells uh, are on cross. I have an enchant weapon. This enchants my weapon with lightning. Uh, on square, I have an AoE buff field. So anybody that is inside this buff field, because remember the game has multiplayer, the game has companions, they're going to deal additional damage to enemies. On circle, I have something that charges my spirit beast faster. We're going to be talking about that a little bit further ahead. And then on triangle, I have a basic projectile that drops a field of poison, essentially. And that's kind of like the spells that I'm running with for my build. You can have something completely different, like you can have fireballs, you can have lightning bolts, you can have uh, ice shots, you can have all of these different things. If you want to go for a full-on wizard build, that is something that you can do. But notice that whenever we cast spells, it consumes our spirit gauge. So the way that this is going to work is you're going to have to master how to cast your spells and then counterattack enemies in order to deal damage that allows you to recover your spirit gauge, right? And um, another thing that you have is if you press on the right bumper, or R1 if you're playing on PlayStation, it's going to give you access to two special martial arts. Now these martial arts are going to vary depending on which weapon you have. Each weapon is going to have a set of their own martial arts, so that is something that you want to pay attention to. But basically, if you hold down on the right bumper and then you press square, we're going to do this special attack for the sword that we have. And if you hold down on the right bumper button and you press triangle, you're going to do this special attack. Naturally, convert that to your Xbox equivalent. It would be right bumper plus X or right bumper plus Y. And once again, notice that that also consumes your spirit. So there's overall four things that can consume your spirit gauge, and those are your spirit attack, getting hit by enemies, casting spells, or doing martial arts. And naturally, like I told you earlier, you do not want to get hit while you are with a full orange gauge because that is going to break your character. So the combat of this game is very much a tug of war between you and the enemies where you have all of these tools to use to spend your spirit, but at the same time, you also have to land a couple of light attacks in order to be able to recharge your gauge so that you don't go too deep into the red to a point where a single enemy attack is going down you and then, you know, if you're fighting multiple enemies, they're all just going to gang up on you and absolutely destroy you. So let me show you guys the effects of like martial arts when they connect. As you can see, that right there, whoops. You see, if you abuse martial arts like I was doing there, 
it's actually going to be a problem. But see, that martial art busted him up pretty good, which is going to allow you to follow up with a critical attack. So clever usage of both martial arts and spells is going to be something that you'll definitely want to do. Like, I can also just charge up my blade with lightning. I'm going to deal more damage. I'm going to inflict the lightning status ailment, which makes the enemies, like, stagger a little bit. So, you know, those are things that you can do, and also I can just open up on an enemy by casting a spell, which in this case it would just be my little... And I can actually fight him in here, and while I'm fighting him, he's basically receiving poison damage. Another enemy spotted me, that's that, that's that aggro sound right there. See, we poisoned him, which also interrupts his actions, and now he's going to be taking damage over time. Different spells can do different things. You can also set enemies on fire by shooting fireballs. You can debuff them with, like, I think the, the water effect will be, like, a slowdown type effect. So, yeah, there's all types of different all kinds of different effects that you can place on enemies by using the different elemental systems and different enemies will have elemental affinities and using the opposing element to them is going to be something that is going to be advantageous for you but you know we're getting a little bit too deep in there just be aware that the whole point is that you balance your spirit gauge whilst you keep on the offensive with light attacks spirit attacks martial uh, i mean spell casting and martial arts and that is kind of like the way that the basic of the combat is going to work. Now there's a couple of more things, particularly when it comes to your defensive options, because it's not all about offense. So the first defensive option that you have is block. You hold down on the left bumper or L1 and you'll go into a blocking stance. Your character moves slowly and you can block enemy attacks. Let me show you what that looks like. Now the thing is, this only allows you to block regular attacks. Sometimes enemies will do this, which is a critical attack, can't block that one. So that attack you either need to deflect it or get out of the way. Now another downside to blocking, which by the way, I rarely ever use the block button in this game. I always gamble for the dodges. And you know, if I miss, I get hit. It is what it is. But uh, you know, blocking is good for when you do not know um, an enemy's moveset. Because blocking is fairly safe. You don't take any damage when you block. Um, and, you know, you can just sit here and block. And you can use it smartly, like, as opposed to what I'm doing, which is very dumb, just keeping it up all the time. So you can, like, lower your guard a little bit. But as you can see, it takes a lot of time for you to recover. So blocking, I find it to be kind of like a last-ditch thing. Because then the enemy is eventually going to break you, and he's going to, you know, be able to punish you for overly blocking. So... But blocking is an option, it is there, and in case you are struggling, you might want to go ahead and try it. But the thing that you should definitely be trying to do is this, deflecting. Now, I deflected him, instantly busted up his weapon, which is something that can happen with some enemies. If you deflect one of their critical attacks, they're going to suffer greatly for it. But the way that deflecting works, it's basically like pressing the dodge button at the very last second right before you're getting hit. So it's basically a parry, and that is going to be something that you are definitely going to want to practice. It takes a while to get into the feel of it if you haven't played Wolong yet. If you've played the demo, you've probably gotten into the rhythm of things as to how you can dodge and do all that stuff. There really isn't like a, a big science when it comes to deflecting. It's just like, hey... The enemy's coming at me, try to predict when the attack's about to hit me, and deflect it. Like, for instance, I'm gonna aggro him, wait for him to attack me, and miss that, miss that. Like, look, I still miss, I'm not particularly good at deflecting. But go ahead, attack me again, and come on, come on. Jesus Christ, I suck at this. <laughs> like that. See, you deflect that. Now, when you deflect, the really cool thing about it is that deflecting will also give your gauge blue spirit and the enemy's gauge orange spirit. So it's almost like if you're attacking them, right? A deflection is essentially an attack. It's just an offensive form of attacking your enemy. You're not really dealing damage. Jesus Christ, I'm sucking at deflecting this dude. You're not really dealing damage, but you are inflicting uh, spirit damage. So that is something that you can definitely do, and that is something that you should definitely shoot for. And like I said, this also increases their um, their spirit gauge into the orange, which is going to allow you to break them a little bit faster. Usually I try to follow up one of these with one of my own spirit attacks. And as you can see, that is very effective. I broke him, and then boom, you finish it off, right? But deflecting is definitely something that you want to go ahead and you want to practice. 
And even more important than deflecting regular attacks is going to be deflecting critical attacks because those are going to give you a massive advantage. Let's see if I can bait out a critical attack in order to deflect them. Just like that. And not only we instantly busted him up, broke his weapon, we also instantly broke his posture and were able to capitalize by wrapping it up with a fatal attack. Fatal attacks, once again, just a reminder, is basically your spirit attack, which is your triangle or your Y button. So that is something that you'll definitely want to do. And here's the interesting thing when it comes to deflection. You can actually deflect everything. There hasn't been a single thing in the game that I haven't been able to, to deflect. Like, I'm talking down to the point where you know how sometimes enemies will have those rolling traps that will attack you? They have those here, like spiked logs, and they'll roll spiked logs at you. You can just deflect through that. Not a problem. Like, big boss, mega, super hyper attacks, you can deflect them. No problem. And it's ac it actually feels great. It feels super rewarding when you're able to nail those, those deflections because it's just one of those things that you it just feels great because it's a, it's a massive attack that is coming to you and you're just like no i'm just gonna go ahead and dodge that and the thing about it the only trick that i would have for deflecting is try getting into the rhythm like if you think an attack is coming just dodge just in case right and try to get into the rhythm of the enemy's attacks like this see okay that attack was coming what and here's the thing if you can't deflect right if you can't deflect, another thing that you can do is just dodge twice. Because if you dodge twice, your character is going to jump backwards. So you can use this to kind of like dodge away really far and circle the, the thing. And as you can see, just dodging doesn't actually consume your spirit gauge. So the only thing that consumes your spirit gauge is attempting to deflect. So the very first tap of a dodge consumes spirit gauge. But if you spam it afterwards... You can go everywhere, and this thing does have um, invincibility frames, but you're not going to be able to dodge the whole world just doing this. But just be aware that this is an option. Like, if you need to reset, like if an enemy is super pressuring you, and you're really struggling to deflect them, then get the hell out of there. Just get out, right? Just dodge your way out of the situation. Boom, done. Problem solved, right? Now, let's talk about another uh, offensive technique. Namely, we're going to be talking about backstabs. So backstabs is something that you can do in, um, in Wo Long here. The way that you're going to do it is you're going to approach the enemy without running right into him, right? You're going to slow walk to the enemy, okay? That is very important because unfortunately I can't slow walk to him and then just stay there because he's going to aggro. So that's why I'm showing it to you here. So if you slightly tilt the analog stick of your controller, you're going to be able to slow walk. And I already hear you guys out there that are going to be playing this on PC going like, still the controller, Rurkan, I'm playing on a keyboard, bro. What the hell? If you're playing on keyboard, then press whatever button you have for guard, and you can slow walk to him whilst guarding. And that is also going to allow you to go ahead and backstab him. And as a matter of fact, that also goes for console players that struggle to just slightly tilt the stick. You can just hold the, the block button and walk up to the enemy. So for instance, we're going to target him. We're going to slowly walk over to him whilst guarding. And you can keep the guard button pressed. And then press triangle or Y. Boom. Backstab. Which is pretty cool. It lets you start the battles with a massive advantage. Now... Another way to do backstabs is if you happen to have the high ground and the enemies haven't detected you. You can also backstab from the air. So for instance, this dude right here, he has no idea what's coming to him. We're going to double jump because you can double jump in this game by pressing X twice. We're going to double jump off this ledge and land on top of that dude with a plunging attack. And now he's dead. See, so those are the two ways in which you can go ahead and do backstabs even though one of them's a plunging attack but whatever but yeah that is one of the ways that you can get the drop on enemies and one of the really cool things is that in this game you do have mantling so as you can see right here you can mantle this by double jumping so whenever you have the opportunity to jump onto a rooftop or get the high ground on an enemy i would definitely recommend that you take it because then if you see the enemies and they're below you you can just go like oh damn okay pop oops i messed that up but you guys saw what I did earlier. You guys get the idea. Just go ahead and dodge away from this. 
Now, an important part of critical attacks, both yours and the enemies, is that they have a direct effect on your morale. So now it's time to talk about these numbers that we see here on screen, particularly the one that's directly above our health gauge. If you notice that our number right now is 13, the enemy's number is 11, and the number on the top right-hand side of the minimap is 10. So what exactly does that mean? That kind of represents your fighting spirit of your character, the actual morale of your character. And the higher it is, the easier it is going to be for you to defeat enemies. Think of it almost as like the levels of an enemy within each specific scenario. So that enemy right there is level 11. And right now I'm level 13 because of my morale. But what happens is the different attacks, the different critical attacks that we perform have an impact on that. So for instance, if I go over to the enemy and allow him to hit me with one of those critical attacks, the ones that glow red, then he is going to diminish my morale because, hey, I just took a massive blow. Now my morale is lower and it's going to be harder for you to continue fighting depending on the enemy's morale level. So pay attention to our morale, which right now is 13, and eventually he's going to go ahead and do a special attack. I'm gonna let him hit us, and when he does, you'll notice that our morale is going to lower. There it is. Boom. Notice how he went from 13 to 12. So you most definitely want to avoid getting hit by those, as, you know, it's, it, it is kind of like a hit to your morale. You're like, oh man, I messed up, and now the enemy is punishing me, and now my morale is lower. And now you may be wondering, okay, but earlier you also said that morale is somehow influenced by the number that's on the top right-hand side of the screen. So the number on the top right-hand side is your fortitude. So fortitude establishes a baseline for your current morale, and it is determined by the number of flags that you've planted, or sometimes there are special conditions in a level that influence your level of morale based on you know, just like what situation the level happens to be taking place in. So our baseline for this level right now is 10. That means that even if you get hit by critical attacks like three, four, five times, your morale is never going to go any lower than 10. But it can go higher than 10 if you are performing well in combat. Like, for instance, by performing backstabs or anything like that, you're going to be performing well in combat and that is going to raise your morale, as you can see right here. Killing enemies is also going to raise your morale. You can see that we're now back to level 13. However, if you die, you lose everything. So for instance, I'm gonna go ahead and allow this dude to kill me so that we also get to explain how death works. Go on, do it. Do it now. Here, I'll help you. I'll set myself on fire for you. Okay, and boom, we are now burning. Let's move over here to ensure that he kills me. He also set himself on fire. Jesus, you didn't have to be that dedicated to the cause. Ugh. Now, if you paid attention to the lower left-hand side of the screen, you would notice that we also lost a whole bunch of the yellow things, which are basically your souls. And now, if you look at our morale level, it lowered all the way down to 10. So basically, you lose half of the souls equivalent that you are carrying and the only way to get it back is if you kill the enemy that killed you. So, for instance, in this case, he killed us. Also notice how he's glowing yellow and stuff. The reasoning is so that you can easily identify the enemy that previously killed you. If you look on the radar on the top right-hand side, he's also going to be marked by the little yellow triangle thing, letting you know, hey, this dude killed you. You probably want to kill him to recover your souls. If not then you lose those souls. It's just that simple. So obviously you want to go ahead and get your revenge on enemies whenever they do this to you. And also, initially he was morale level 12, but because he killed you, his morale raised and he's now morale level 13. So that is, again, it's things that you need to pay attention to. You don't want to be dying left, right, and center. Otherwise, the game is going to punish you. Pay attention to our soul counter, lower left-hand side. Boom. We now recovered the souls that we had previously lost by dying to that dude. But that's like critical attacks, morale, fortitude, and all of that. Another important mechanic to the game's combat is your spirit beast. Now, if you pay attention over there on the lower left-hand side, there's now a pulsing icon. I'm going to be showing you guys the very first spirit beast that you have access to in the game, which is called Chilin. Chilin? I'm not, not sure if that's how... It is pronounced, but yeah, it is um, the very first spirit beast that you have access to. 
And the way that the Spirit Beast works is whenever you charge it up, and you charge it up just by attacking enemies and just doing well in combat overall, or doing deflections, doing backstabs, pretty much anything that involves you hitting an enemy or even getting hit, because if enemies hit you, the Spirit Beast gauge also charges. Anything that involves, uh, you know, combat, basically, is going to charge the Spirit Gauge, assuming that you survive that combat encounter. And the way that you unleash the Spirit Gauge is twofold. You can press triangle and circle if you're on a PlayStation controller or on the Xbox controller, it'd be the buttons Y and B, and that will summon the Spirit Beast to do like one powerful attack, or, you know, depending on the Spirit Beast, it's going to be something different. Certain Spirit Beasts will heal you. There's one Spirit Beast that fights alongside you for a little bit, but, you know, basically pressing triangle and circle or Y and B is going to be like your big one hit from the Spirit Beast. It's big one-time ability. On the other hand, you can also summon the Spirit Beast by resonating with it, and that usually involves enchanting your weapon with a certain element, and also getting a bunch of other benefits that depend on the beast that you currently have equipped, because you're going to be receiving multiple beasts. You know, if you've played um, Neo, you'll be aware of, like, living weapon, stuff like that. This is kind of like something similar to that. So, for instance, if I go up to this dude and just go like, Aha! Spirit Beast! It's going to summon these pillars, which deal damage, and then if anybody comes into contact with these, they explode. And that's it. Your spirit beast gauge is spent. Now, I'm going to be recovering the spirit beast gauge, and I'm going to show you what resonance looks like. Okay, and when it comes to resonance, you basically press uh, X and square, or A and cross on your Xbox controllers, and it's going to look a little bit like this. And that is going to give you a buff that you can now see on the lower uh, middle section of the screen. And as you can see, our weapon is now enchanted with stone, and it deals additional damage and also petrifies enemies. And due to the fact that this is from a defensive type of uh, element, which stone is a defensive element, it basically gives you a bunch of defensive bonuses, which I'm not really going to look into right now because I don't want to be spoiling the Divine Beast for you. I want to be revealing as least as possible so that you can enjoy the game, but just be aware that those are the two ways in which you can uh, utilize your Divine Beast. Now, in the start of the video, I talked about how your morale and fortitude are affected by some of these flags that you get to plant throughout the level, and now we're going to be discussing just that. As you can see, there's a flag location right there, as well as a flag location right there. Now, if you pay attention to our fortitude level on the top right hand side, which, like I said, is our baseline morale level, whenever you plant a flag, that morale level is going to raise. It is going to be one, one rank raised when you're planting one of these white flags, which are a marking flag, and two rank raises whenever you placed one of the orange flags. But that's not all. These flags are actually have a very unique mechanic that personally I really, really enjoy. Now, if you notice, I don't have a whole lot of health. So say for instance, I'm going through this level and you know, there's enemies around. I just killed a bunch of enemies and uh, you know, imagine my health is full, but there's an enemy over there in that corner, right? Now that I've found this flag spot, I might consider, hmm, do I want to raise the marking flag right now or do I want to fight that enemy? Because whenever you put down one of these flags, it is going to heal you back to full. So you can essentially use these flags kind of like as a potion. So let's say there's an enemy there. I might go ahead and decide to engage on him. However, let's imagine, for instance, my morale level right now is 15. Let's say my morale level is 10 and the enemy over there is morale level like 13 or 14, right? Then you might be thinking, hmm. But if I place down this flag, it's going to raise my fortitude by one, therefore setting my baseline to 11. And now I'm in much more even footing to fight that enemy who is like level 13 or 14. So that's kind of a risk reward decision that you are going to have to make. Do I want to go fight the enemy and take some damage and then come back here and use this flag as a potion? Or do I want to use the flag prevent uh, preemptively and therefore boost my chances of killing this enemy easier. Again, risk reward, and that's something that I really appreciate. But as you can see, my health right now is not full. So if I go ahead and I place this flag, boom, full health and fortitude rank increase to 11. So now if you die, you're just going to go back down to 11, not 10. That's the marking flags. Now, if we go all the way to the battle flag, the battle flag is even cooler. It's also going to heal you to full, 
Um, trust me on that. I, I know that my health is full, but if you were to place the flag down right here, it's going to heal you to full. But it has another feature, which is, if you notice right now, I have three potions. Look to the lower left-hand side corner. My maximum potions in this character right now is six. So... I basically have a decision to make now. It's like, okay, so do I place this flag, which is going to completely restore my heals, or do I explore the level some more? Because I still have three potions. So basically, I could come in here and be like, hey, maybe I'll tackle this enemy instead. What? Who's level 17 and I'm level 15, so I got to be careful here. I actually have to pay attention. Uh, but, you know, do I tackle this enemy instead? And then I take the flag, or do I do it the other way around? Right there, reversing the flow of battle, and... Boosh! See ya. Right, so I killed the enemy, and I was like, oh man, we gained morale. I used one potion, though, so now I'm a little bit lower on potions. So now I can go in here, and I can do this, and I can get full potions. And also remember, there's another marking flag there. I could just heal myself to full and continue to explore. But that's the beauty of this flag system. It, allow, it gives you a risk-reward situation, wherein you're like, oh, do I place the flag right now? Or do I continue exploring, place the flag later? And, you know, the, the downside of this is, say, for instance, you find one of these... And then you're like, oh, I'm going to continue exploring. Then you die. You're going to restart back at the last flag that you activated. So, again, risk reward. Do you want to activate the checkpoint now or not? But the cool thing is when you place these flags, enemies don't respawn. So this allows you to basically clear the whole level and, you know, not have to worry about enemies respawning so that you can keep exploring the level. And I really appreciate that freedom. I cannot stress this enough. But, you know, it is what it is. And, um, yeah, that's the flag system. The battle flags and the morale and the fortitude. And right now, as you can see, our fortitude is raised to 13. And if I place this flag, it's going to raise to 14. So this is something that you'll definitely want to do on every level is place down all of the flags. And by the way, if you look again to the top right-hand side corner, you'll notice that there's two numbers there for flags, two out of two. Those are the battle flags, the very first number. So it's the orange ones, which also act as bonfires. And the number below that is the marking flag. So these smaller ones that don't act as bonfires, but just increase your fortitude. So, you know, keep track of how many you're missing. Try to find all the flags in every level, and that is going to make things significantly easier for you. And finally, let's talk about your stats, weapons, and spells and how to go about choosing what type of build you want to be working on. So for starters, this game doesn't really have the traditional stats that we're kind of used to when it comes to RPGs, which usually you go for like your strength, your dexterity, vitality, vigor, you know, those kinds of things. In this game, instead, you have five virtues or five phases. They also refer to these as phases. But basically, you have the wood virtue, fire virtue, earth virtue, metal virtue, and water virtue. And each of these is going to have a different effect on your character. So, for instance, wood virtue, which is the one that I'm focusing on for my very first playthrough of the game, affects your HP and the amount of spirit lost when you get attacked. Your fire virtue affects the amount of spirit gain when you are attacking and the amount of spirit consumed by martial arts. So the more you have a fire, the less spirit your martial arts are going to consume. The earth virtue affects the equipment weight limit and the amount of spirit gain when deflecting an attack. And what that means is this is the like the most defensive virtue that you have. Like wood and earth are probably going to be two of the really defensive ones because wood gives you HP. This one increases your weight limit, which lets you equip heavier armor and stuff like that. And it also gives you more spirit when you are deflecting attacks. So, you know, that's Earth. Then in Metal, you have uh, effects duration that a high level spirit can be maintained for. What that means is you remember the spirit gauge, how it raises up to blue. This allows it to stay in blue longer because it naturally decays over time. And then the spirit consumed by wizardry spells. So if you're someone who wants to be casting a whole lot of spells, metal is like a good one to, to go for as well. And then water, which affects how easily enemies can detect you. This is not something that I consider to be too valuable because I've still been able to just backstab enemies no problem. Uh, and the amount of spirit consumed when you are deflecting. And you're like, spirit consumed? I thought you gain spirit when you deflect. Yeah, this means... When you deflect, but you actually don't hit it on an attack, it consumes spirit. If you put water, it's going to consume less spirit. And now you guys are going to be like, okay, but how am I going to decide which one of these stats do I want to invest in? Because, you know, obviously you got the base 
uh, the baseline of what each of the stats does, but that doesn't tell the whole story. There's another thing, which is wizardry spells. Each of these phases has a set of spells. So you'll want to be looking at it to see, okay, which spells do I want to have? Do I want to have like fire spells, hurl fireballs? All of the phases have some kind of like enchant for your weapon. So fire is going to have flame weapon. Wood has like lightning weapon. Uh, metal has corrosive weapon. So all of these have a weapon enchant that you could put on your weapon. But then things differ from there. So for instance, if you go to the wood phase, which is the one that I'm using, <clears throat> it mostly has stuff that provides you bonuses to yourself as well as your allies. Because remember, there's companions in the game that you can summon and you can buff them using this. Not just companions, you can summon other players as well and you can buff them using stuff from the wood phase. Fire is more about slinging spells. Earth also has a lot of self buffs, mostly tanky stuff and stuff that inflicts ailments on bosses. Like you have a bog here that you place down and it just kind of like slows enemies that come into it and deals damage over time. But it's a more defensive type tree as well. With metal, you have a lot of acids and poisons and stuff like that. Uh, with water, you have a lot of icicle things that you can throw and things that make you harder to detect and move faster, kind of like ninja stuff. So the way in which you're going to decide which of the stats you want to focus on is going to be threefold. You either like a specific spell on the spell tree and you go like, ah, this is the thing I'm going to go for because I like the spells on this tree. And that's one of your decisions, right? The other one is you look at your weapons. So in my case, for instance, one of my favorite weapons is this, the five colored cudgel. This is a bow staff. I have a lot of fun using this staff. And the thing that scales the most with this staff is wood. Therefore, my main is wood. And if you look at the scaling there, you'll notice that also scales C plus with metal. Therefore, I decided my secondary stat is going to be metal. And that's why I have that little toxic bubble thing that I throw. But for, in my case, it was mostly decided around the weapon. I was like, I like this weapon, so therefore these are the stats that I'm going to have. That is one way of going about it. Let's say, for instance, oh, I like the iron sword. And you, okay, you like the iron sword. You probably want to be leveling up uh, fire and wood then because you got B scaling on fire, C scaling on wood. You know, that's how you would go about choosing it if you want to go through the weapon. On the other hand, if you want to go through the spells, and then you can just go to the wizardry spells and be like, oh, you know what? I really like this frozen arrow thing that I can do with water phase. Okay, I'll probably level up water phase and then choose my weapon based on that. Because then you go back and you're like, okay, now let's find a weapon that works for water. Let me see if I can find one real quick. I don't know if I have one. Okay, so the cap, no, the cavalry javelin isn't really... Okay, here we go. The Hook Blades of King Elu. As you can see right there, they scale B with water, C with earth. So you might be considering, oh, maybe I'll do a build around uh, water and earth because I like the frozen thing in there. Or you can just ignore the earth thing. This is just mostly to scale your weapons. It's not really a big deal because it's a secondary stat. But you can basically have this one and use this weapon as your water weapon and then build everything around using these weapons, which are also pretty cool, by the way. They have a really neat spirit attack. But you guys get the idea. The idea is you choose one thing, whether that thing is, I like the effect that the stat has, you know, like I, I want to be able to sling more spells. Okay, I'm going to do metal virtue because that's going to give me uh, less spirit consumed by wizardry spells. Or, I like this weapon, therefore I'm going to choose the stat that goes with this weapon. Or, I like this spell, therefore I'm going to choose the stat that goes with this spell. And then you kind of just like build around that. And that's basically how you would go about doing things. But anyway, that is going to be it for my beginner's guide. It's already way longer than I initially intended it to. And this is actually the second time that I'm recording it because the first recording I didn't really like it very much. Hopefully... This is helpful for you guys. I really hope that you guys end up enjoying the game as much as I'm enjoying it right now. And if this video was useful for you, then hit it up with a like. It really, really helps out. Subscribe for more content around Wolong and Monster Hunter and Wild Hearts and all of these amazing games are coming out. Even Tears of the Kingdom. I'm going to be playing that as well. So hopefully you guys will stay tuned for that. But um, yeah, thank you very much for watching. I'll see you guys in the next one. Stay strong. Stay safe. Peace out.